on World News Tonight. Conflict continues. The world holds its breath as the tensions on Ukraine border continue to rise exponentially. Some even believing the war is well underway. Despite this, world leaders are willing to give Russia one last chance to avert the crisis. Royal Dilemma Queen Elizabeth has been one of the latest targets of the pandemic as she has been afflicted with mild symptoms of the virus. Her recovery hanging in the balance as the UK anxiously await good news. Welcome back. Australian citizens are overcome with tears of joy as families reunite following the reopening of the country's borders to the rest of the world. And the grand finale. The Winter Games go out with a bang as fireworks bathe the Beijing sky with a rainbow of colours. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with the stark new warnings of the Russian invasion. The world tonight is holding its breath as they await Russian President Vladimir Putin to make his move with grim warnings from America's leaders. Many fear that he has already made up his mind to go to war in Ukraine, even as they try to buy time for diplomacy. U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin have agreed in principle to a summit over Ukraine, offering a possible path out of one of the most dangerous European crises in decades. A barrage of artillery fire increasing in war-ravaged Donbass, with more than 1,500 explosions in just the past day. The region is part of Ukraine, but controlled by pro-Russian separatists. Across the border in Belarus, just hours from Kyiv, an ominous sign the Russian forces could be there to stay indefinitely. This morning, the Belarusian defense minister extended his country's joint military exercises with Russia, which were scheduled to end today, citing the increasing violence in Donbass. Violence, U.S. officials allege, the Russians have stoked to create the pretext for war. President Biden held an emergency meeting with his National Security Council today. There is still an option to, uh, uh, for him to pull back. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to prevent a war. As French President Emmanuel Macron made a last-ditch effort to avert an invasion with a phone call to President Vladimir Putin. Putin blamed the escalation in Donbass on Ukrainian forces and called on the West to respond to his demands for security guarantees. There is no innovation and there is no such plans. But on the front lines, Ukrainian soldiers say they're already under attack. <laughs> President Zelensky calling for an immediate ceasefire. Inside separatist controlled Donbass, thousands of women and children are being evacuated on buses and trains. They're seeking safety in Russia. Final destination unknown. I'm afraid because I have two little children, afraid that something can happen with them, she says. The men forced to stay and fight for Russia backed separatists. Families torn apart by a war that has yet to be declared. While tonight in Kyiv, people can only pray that this war will end before it officially begins. Britain's 95-year-old Queen Elizabeth II tested positive for COVID-19, becoming the latest royal to contract the virus. But her symptoms are mild and she intends to continue with light duties at her Windsor Castle residence. Buckingham Palace announced it at midday. Elizabeth II has tested positive for COVID-19. The Queen, who turns 96 in two months, is said to have only mild cold-like symptoms. She had her first vaccine in January last year and is believed to have had all her follow-up jabs. But on the streets of London, people express their concerns given their sovereign's advanced age. Most people in the country have never known any monarch other than her, so she embodies the UK in so many ways. So. Uh, anything happening to her, that's not good. Well, you're sad, but she'll get over it. She's that kind of a woman, we hope. She has to get better. We can't afford to lose her just yet. Prime Minister Boris Johnson led the messages of goodwill, wishing her a speedy return to vibrant good health. The Queen will remain at Windsor Castle, where she's resided since the pandemic began. It was there that she spent time with her son, Prince Charles, on February 8th, two days before he tested positive. Queen Elizabeth has generally enjoyed robust health, although an unexplained issue saw her spend a night in hospital last October. Since then, her public appearances have been rare, but she resumed in-person audiences last week. Good morning. 
The monarch is celebrating 70 years on the throne this year, the first British sovereign to do so, with nationwide celebrations planned for June. Plagued with controversy from human rights abuse claims, diplomatic boycotts and even doping scandals on an unprecedented scale, China's infamous Beijing Winter Games for this year drew the closing curtain on the event quite successfully. Beijing doused its Olympic flame on Sunday night, capping off games that will be remembered for its extreme COVID-19 policies, as well as the doping scandal surrounding 15-year-old Russian skating sensation Kamila Valieva. Chinese President Xi Jinping was on hand for the closing ceremony, where International Olympics Committee President Thomas Bach praised Beijing's organizers. The Beijing Games were the second Olympics in six months to be held in a closed loop after last summer's delayed events in Tokyo. In China, the tight seal prevented the spread of COVID-19 at the Olympics or into the community, vindicating a zero-COVID policy that has isolated China from the rest of the world. But many athletes still had their Olympic dreams dashed by positive tests that prevented them from competing. China was, however, spared any embarrassing protests by competitors over its treatment of the Uyghur Muslim minority. And thousands of foreign journalists on hand were stuck inside the loop, unable to report more widely. But the game's biggest legacy will be the controversy surrounding skater Valieva, who failed a doping test in December, but the result only revealed a day after she helped her team win an Olympic medal. Though she was eventually allowed to compete in her final singles event, Valieva stumbled under pressure, her performance prompting a harsh reaction from her coaches. The saga reopened debate over whether minors should be allowed to compete in the games. An investigation by the world's top anti-doping authority into Valieva's entourage is also underway. North Korea suspended its recent flurry of missile launches during the Beijing Winter Olympics. But now that the Olympics truce has ended, watchers are concerned that Pyongyang will resume military activities, possibly in April. As the 2022 Winter Olympics came to a close, attention shifted to North Korea and the possibility it may resume military activities. The regime, a close ally of Beijing, held back on further missile tests for the past few weeks after seven launches just last month, including its intermediate-range ballistic missile, the Hwasong-12. Instead, the leader Kim Jong-un has appeared to have focused on solidifying internal unity by attending the groundbreaking ceremony for housing project, as well as celebrations for the 80th birthday of the late leader Kim Jong-il last week, which ended with various events and performances instead of a military parade or another missile launch. Watchers are voicing concerns over Pyongyang's possible resumption of military activities and also warning that it has become more difficult to predict when they might occur. But if the North does decide to carry out military acts, experts point to April when big anniversaries have fallen in the year 2022, a, quote, revolutionary year for the regime. But the expert further noted the North will remain cautious on terminating its self-imposed moratorium on testing nuclear weapons, as that will be its one and only card for putting pressure on the Biden administration. And Saur's Unification Ministry has once again called on the North to choose a dialogue and cooperation for a peace on the Korean Peninsula. The Unification Ministry has urged the North to suspend activities that threaten peace and cause instability in the region and maintain the moratorium it promised to the international community. The spokesperson further added as Saur will continue to closely monitor the North's related moves and prepare for all possibilities. The situation in Canada's capital has begun shifting back to its normal state following the weeks of unrelenting protests from the so-called Freedom Convoy advocating aggressively for a drop in restrictions. The authorities have continued to clean up abandoned vehicles and arrest the last of the untruly citizens left behind. Police tape and fencing are all that remain on the snow-swept streets of downtown Ottawa on Sunday, a day after officers cleared out a three-week protest camp that had blockaded the Canadian capital. Hey, hey, hey. Demonstrators had used hundreds of trucks and vehicles to block the city since January 28th in what began as a protest by truck drivers angry over cross-border COVID-19 vaccine requirements. But the blockade turned into a demonstration against Canada's Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the government. Trudeau on Monday invoked emergency powers to give his government wider authority to stop the protests. And on Saturday, cops moved in. This demonstration is over. Go home. If you don't go home, we will remove you from the streets. 
Ottawa's interim police chief, Steve Bell, said officers used pepper spray and stun grenades and made dozens of arrests. Police said 38 vehicles had been towed. Bell said that while the blockade was over, the investigation was not. If you are involved in this protest, we will actively look to identify you and follow up with financial sanctions and criminal charges. Absolutely. We, we, this investigation will go on for months to come. The federal government said on Saturday it would provide up to 20 million Canadian dollars to Ottawa businesses that have suffered losses due to the blockades. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Australia fully reopened its international borders to travellers vaccinated against the coronavirus after nearly two years of pandemic-related closings as tourists returned and hundreds of people were reunited with their families and friends. There were hugs and gifts of Vegemite at Australia's biggest airport on Monday as it buzzed with reunited family and friends. The country has welcomed back tourists now that the international borders are fully reopened. At Sydney Airport, American traveller Lauren Potter was one of the travellers overjoyed with the restrictions lifting. Yeah, as soon as I opened up the borders, I just knew I could finally come and see my family and, and attend my brother's wedding like on March 4th. So that's what I'm really excited about, to have the whole family together again. After more than two years of closures, you can now visit Australia if you're fully vaccinated. More than 50 international flights were set to land in the country on Monday, including 27 touching down at Sydney, the largest city. Australian Trade and Tourism Minister Dan Tehan said the tourism industry is hopeful for a rebound in bookings after the 43 billion US dollar industry was hamstrung by closed borders. The hugs, the tears has just been wonderful. It's been a party out here at Sydney Airport. Everyone's celebrating. It's so great to have the international tourists back from right around the world. Australia shifted away from its fortress-style controls and relentless lockdowns at the end of last year and began living with the virus after reaching higher levels of vaccination. Australia's outbreak of the Omicron coronavirus variant appears to have passed its peak, with hospital admissions steadily falling over the past three weeks. Travelling to Germany has been highly restricted to the rest of the world, especially for the countries mentioned on their COVID concern list. However, it seems that the country is now loosening its restrictions to return to a better sense of normalcy, as more countries have been dropped from the red list. We have out there in the world news special correspondent Inuka Ponza, who joins us now from Kleve in Germany for more. Inuka. Yes, Shinali. Travellers from three EU countries and 17 non-EU countries will be able to travel to Germany under facilitated entry rules as the latter has decided to remove them from the high-risk list. Updating the list of countries that are no longer highly affected by the COVID-19 disease, the German body responsible for disease prevention and control, the Robert Koch Institute, has announced that Spain, Andorra and three French overseas territories, French Guiana, Mayotte, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, will no longer be part of the high-risk list. Along with Spain, the Balearic and the Canary Islands will also be removed from the high-risk list. The move means that travellers from these countries and territories will no longer be required to register their entry. In addition, they will also be exempt from the quarantine requirement. Nonetheless, the German authorities have emphasised that everyone is still required to present a valid certificate that proves that the holder has recovered, tested negative or has been vaccinated against the virus, regardless of their country of origin. The requirement to hold one of the certificates applies to all travellers over the age of six. Thank All right, thank you. That was Abdul Darana World News Special Correspondent Inu Kaponza reporting from Cleve in Germany. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed officially inaugurated electricity production from the country's mega dam on the Blue Nile, a milestone in the controversial multi-billion dollar project. With great fanfare, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed inaugurates the start of electricity production at the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. 
Over 10 years after breaking ground, Africa's largest dam and hydroelectric power plant is now operational, standing 145 metres tall and stretching a 1.8 kilometre wide section of the Blue Nile. The project has faced funding difficulties, with taxpayers' money going towards the dam, which is estimated to have cost 4.2 billion US dollars. A source of national pride, the dam has sown discord with Egypt and Sudan, two countries downstream of the project which worry about their water supply. After announcing that it had fallen below the water poverty line in January, Cairo is demanding that Ethiopia not fill up the dam too fast and regularly threatens military intervention. Last summer, the UN urged diplomatic discussions between three countries. Those calls, however, didn't stop Ethiopia from pushing ahead with the second phase of filling in July. Abiy Ahmed has promised to sell energy generated at cost price to his neighbors and maintains that the dam will benefit the entire region economically. It seems that the probes against Trump's presidential reign have an all clear from necessary authorities as he has lost the bid to prevent further investigations occurring, all allowing to more light to be shed on the accusations of incitement of the January 6th riots. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has lost a bid to dismiss lawsuits accusing him of inciting the January 6th Capitol riots. Trump's case rested on a 1982 Supreme Court ruling, which holds that presidents are shielded from lawsuits over their official acts. A judge from the U.S. District Court for Washington, D.C. rejected that argument Friday, ruling that Trump's inflammatory speech before the Capitol attack wasn't part of his official presidential duties. Brought forward by Democratic lawmakers and two police officers, the three lawsuits in question allege a conspiracy between Trump and the Capitol rioters to thwart President Biden's election victory. The lawsuits can now move toward trial, though the judge agreed to dismiss co-defendants Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump Jr. A lawyer for Trump did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Trump's team argues that the president's remarks on January 6th were protected as free speech under the U.S. Constitution. Meanwhile, Democratic lawmakers, including U.S. Representatives Eric Swalwell and Jerry Nadler, have cited a law from 1871 that prohibits political intimidation. Meanwhile, India has been making advancements in international partnerships, especially with the EU. Technological and Development Corporation is expected within the region for future projects as well. Let's cross over to Abdel in a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar, who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri? Yes, Shenali. India and Germany share a commitment to promoting green growth and clean technology, External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar has said. As he held a constructive meeting with German Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development Sven Hans in Munich, Mr. J. Shankar arrived in Germany to take part in the Munich Security Conference 2020. He stated that the delegations discussed their respective development partnership outlook and that they held a share a commitment to promoting green growth and clean tech. Mr. J. Shankar also held talks with foreign and security policy advisor to German Chancellor Jens Plattner. According to him, they had a good meeting with a useful review of global development. He also met his counterpart from Ireland, Simon Conway, in conclusion to his series of meetings and stated that Ireland could play a greater role in India's EU engagement. The good news doesn't stop there for the country as India logged a lower number of new coronavirus infections. The daily COVID-19 cases have remained below 1 lakh for 15 consecutive days. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was Abdur in a World News Pressure Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern said New Zealand will lift COVID-19 vaccine mandates and other social distancing measures after the Omicron peak has passed, as protesters occupying the parliament grounds again clashed with police. Donald Trump's new social media venture, Truth Social, launched on Apple's App Store, potentially marking the former president's return to social media after he was banned from several platforms last year. 
A large fire destroyed a five-story apartment building with around 50 units in the western German city, injuring at least three people. The fire had already spread at a very high speed over a large area of the building. Carlos Alcaraz became the youngest ATP 500 winner ever as he stormed to victory in the Rio Open final against Diego Schwartzman. Alcaraz won his final match on the ATP Tour at the same event two years ago and now the 18-year-old Spaniard made history by winning the entire tournament. The tensions over Ukraine are pushing up the price of gold as a safe haven asset and the price of oil because of the risk of the sanctions on Russia could reduce supplies. Ukraine is also one of the world's main sources of grain. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow on more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a spectacular fireworks display which brought a fitting end to the Beijing Winter Olympics. Thank you for watching us. Good night.